Well, good afternoon. So glad to see you here. Um, welcome to what is going to be a really unique program here at GW. For the first time, SNAG Films and the DC Office of Motion Picture Television Development is going to award Washington's Best Film. And we could not be more proud that that film is today some, Washington, some George Washington University students from the Institute for Documentary Filmmaking. So. But we are, um, we're waiting just ever so briefly for the mayor, who will be arriving very shortly. And we have some amazingly esteemed guests today. But in advance of all that, I'm going to ask a couple of things. First of all, I want to know who out here is a student here at GW. Raise your hands. Look at all those students who are here today. Isn't that fabulous? Um, one of the things that I think is so important about film is not just to think about it as film, but to think about the content of the film. So in um, sort of preparing for this afternoon's event, we wanted to obviously honor our wonderful, wonderful student filmmakers, but also to really delve into the subject matter of the film. And as you'll see, um, this is a the, the film poses very, very interesting questions of um, uh, felons and what happens when they are released back into society. And it's just, it's an amazingly important question. So what we did is we reached out to all across campus to the sociology department, to courses that had to do with criminal justice, that had to do with um, you know, m different methods of incarceration, and we wanted the students to have the opportunity to really witness not just the wonderful film, but also to hear from this amazing post-screening panel that is gonna talk about the difficulties and current policies that have to do with how do you bring people back into society once they've been to prison. So after um, the film, you're gonna um, be able to really, and I, I want the students to engage, and one of the things I'm good at is getting you to talk. So um, we're gonna have a very, very lively discussion afterwards after the film. But um, so what I'd like to do now is to ask you to turn off your cell phones um, just for the ever briefest moment, um, or at least turn them to silent, which would be ideal. Actually, don't turn them off, turn them to silent, because we are live tweeting from the event, um, and so I want you to use hashtag snag films as your, um, your live tweet. I want you to be communicating about what's going on in the auditorium today, but I don't want your cell phones to ring. So um, what we're gonna be asking you to do is um, uh, let's have, um, sort of a moment where we're gonna, I'm gonna let the mayor have a seat for the ever briefest moment. And um, we're gonna, there we are. Hello, now everybody's gonna shake hands. Um, <laughs> but that's good, we're all friends here. Um, and I'd like to introduce uh, the president of George Washington University, Stephen Knapp. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Nina, and it really is uh, a delight to welcome all of you to the presentation of the first ever Washington's Best Film Award. I'd like to extend a special welcome to the Mayor of the District of Columbia and George Washington alumnus, the Honorable Vincent Gray, to the City Council members of Ed Alexander and Phil Mendelson, D.C. Deputy Mayors Victor Hoskins and Paul Quander, and Ted Leonsis and Rick Allen of Snag Films, the co-sponsor of this award, and uh, I think uh, all of us in Washington, D.C. know uh, Mr. Leonsis as entrepreneur, sports magnate, and philanthropist extraordinaire in all those categories. So thank you all for being with us today. And I'm very pleased to join you to honor the hard work and artistry of this group of George Washington Documentary Center students. All of us at George Washington are delighted and honored that Release to Life has been recognized by two partners, Snag Films and the D.C. Office of Motion Picture and Television Development, and it's especially fitting that this first award of its kind should go to a film that concerns a subject of such very great importance to the District of Columbia. And now, it's my honor to introduce the next speaker, the mayor of the District of Columbia. Mayor Gray has devoted his entire career to public service, which is a core value of this university, and all of us at George Washington are extremely proud that before embarking on his distinguished career, he was a student at George Washington University. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the mayor of the District of Columbia. Well, 
Well, thank you very much, uh, President Knapp. I am delighted to be here, always delighted to be on the campus of George Washington University. It, uh, it always feels like coming home. Uh, I spent a number of years on this campus, some very interesting times, and uh, in some respects, I'm sorry those times are over. In some respects, I'm very glad that we don't have to live uh, under some of those circumstances uh, again. I want to thank the President for doing such an extraordinary job uh, here at the university. He not only leads this uh, university with exceptional skill, he is somebody who really has thoroughly involved himself uh, in the uh, activities of the uh, District of Columbia, and I want to thank him for his leadership also among the presidents of universities here in the city as we work together to find ways in which the universities can take on additional responsibility, which we really appreciate. So how about a big hand for our president, Steve Knapp? Um, I also want to thank Ted Leonsis um, and Snag Films for partnering with us on this important effort to recognize and elevate the profile of the district's most talented uh, filmmakers. Uh, Ted has been a catalyst for many things in Washington, D.C. However, most of you don't know that while Ted was working on documentaries and establishing Snag Films, he coined and championed the term filmanthropy. Is that right? Philanthropy, it's a great term. Film and phil 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 philanthropy, putting the two together. What you probably don't know either, I've asked a lot of people, did you, did you know that Ted Leonsis used to be the mayor uh, of a city? I think in Florida, is that right, Ted? So we thank you for your public service, and uh, we hope those were memorable days for you. Mine certainly are memorable in some days, to say the least. <laughs> um, it is his unique way uh, in terms of the, the, the uh, phrase that he has termed, his unique way of combining film and philanthropy uh, through uh, phil filmanthropy. Is that the right way to pronounce that? Filmanthropy. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a tongue twister, isn't it? <laughs> uh, he has helped to raise awareness of important issues uh, with the goal of promoting change by increasing volunteerism and activating charitable giving uh, here in the city. And I know personally of his generosity with both his time uh, and the resources that he's been able to generate over a period of years. Uh, he is a committed philanthropist and actively involved with many charities, including Best Buddies, DC Central Kitchen, ePals, the Sea Forever Foundation, which runs a uh, charter school. Uh, is that right? Uh, I think it's, it's my Angelo. Uh, they run Street Soccer USA, Venture Philanthropy Partners, Youth Aids, and so many others. Uh, through the, the uh, Leonsis Foundation, his sports teams, snag films, and his family's personal giving, Ted has served and supported over 400 charities within the last 12 months. That is phenomenal. Um, I want to personally thank him for all that he has done and continues to do to make life better for so many. I wonder if you all knew um, that the Los Angeles Times has called our city Documentary Central that the Hollywood Reporter uh, has referred to the district as DocuWood. Uh, to me, this is a well-deserved name for our thriving documentary uh, in, uh, production industry. Having met many of our local filmmakers and seen so many of our incredible films, there's little question that our city is the documentary capital, not only of the, uh, not only of the nation, but of the universe. And uh, we, we're gonna be the first people to shoot a, a documentary on the moon. Um, we also, in, in all seriousness, we are working hard uh, to be able to, to bring, bring more filming. Uh, Crystal Palmer, who heads our Office of Motion Picture and Television uh, Film Development. Where are you, Crystal? In the back. Okay. Should be down front. <laughs> anyway, she's working hard. We're working hard to be able to bring uh, more film opportunities uh, here to the city, working with Councilmember Orange, who has oversight of that area. Uh, we went out to Hollywood, uh, out to the Los Angeles to meet with some of the firms out there. Crystal and I have been to New York since, and we're really working hard to be able to bring more opportunities uh, here to the city, uh, especially opportunities uh, like these. Um, I want to um, I want to congratulate the extraordinary young filmmakers who successfully tackled uh, an important topic uh, like they did in terms of the winning. Uh, effort. The winning film, as you know, is entitled Released to Life. 
Uh, it is a documentary that chronicles the struggles and challenges that returning citizens uh, face when they're released from prison. And certainly is a timely topic for us in the District of Columbia because we have literally hundreds of people who are returning each year uh, from incarceration and we need to do everything we can to make sure they have an opportunity to lead a productive uh, life. Um, we had an event on Saturday and there's some people in this room, I see Nancy Ware here uh, and others, Paul Quanda who were there. We had almost 400 people who at one time were incarcerated who came together uh, on Saturday and what was a truly upbeat uh, moment as people are trying to reintegrate to get a, get a, a new start uh, on their lives and looking, us to, looking to us to be able to be as helpful as we possibly can uh, to help facilitate that. Um, it was remarkable, the uh, positive spirit that existed in that room. And we had a speaker who was thoroughly uh, entertaining and informative, and that was Dexter Manley, who used to be the, uh, the uh, defensive end for the Washington Redskins. And he talked about his struggles and where he is with his own life uh, at this point. Uh, I want to recognize, too, I think he's here. Is Charles Thornton here? Stand up, Charles. Sorry. Charles Thornton heads our um, newly named uh, Office of Returning Citizen Affairs and did a great job in putting together the event that we had on Saturday. And I hope that people will find a way to work with him because what he is doing is trying to make sure that people have a new lease on life and that they don't, frankly, revert to some of the kinds of things that got them into difficulty uh, in the first place. So thank you very much, Charles. How about a big hand for Charles and what he's doing? Again, I want to congratulate the young filmmakers who made uh, Release uh, to Life. And with that having been said, it is a great honor for me to be able to introduce a man who has done so much for so many. Uh, and we're delighted that he is a part of our great city. Uh, he has wonderful sports teams, the Washington Caps, the uh, Washington Wizards, and, and just as a, a, a sterling person. Please join me in welcoming Ted Leontes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it was wonderful to be introduced by our mayor, who um, not only has to lead this city as a business enterprise, but also helps to set the agenda for social responsibility. And I think an endeavor like today really helps to set the tone for both the intersection of business and commerce. We want to bring people in in production budgets and employees into our city to make more and more films. Film is our greatest export as a nation. Uh, more people watch the IP that we create and are exported now um, through filmmaking than any other product and service that our country manufactures. Um, but also we want to make film that pursues a double bottom line. It's not only good for business, but it helps to activate charitable giving. It helps to initiate conversations like we will uh, have after this award ceremony. And so um, this is a very, very uh, uh, important day and it's wonderful to have this as the inaugural um, best, Washington's best film. And that sounds immodest, doesn't it? That someone could literally say that they have the best film. So um, I also like to thank President Knapp um, and Nina Seavey and, and Frank Sesno, uh, they gave me a tour of the documentary center here. And I have to say it's best in class. It's the best infrastructure um, for both undergraduate and graduate students that I've seen. And you have very, very committed people. And it's no, um, no luck that the first film that won would be generated and initiated from uh, this fine institution, and it's also wonderful that one of your alums happens to run the city. <laughs> and so, um, so it's great too to have other DC government dignitaries here, like Phil Mendelson and uh, Yvette Alexander and Councilman Orange. And but most importantly, it's because the students are here, and uh, the students are the lifeblood of a city. Uh, the, the reason a city becomes a creative class is because of the great academic institutions and then the students who pour into the city and then some of them hopefully that stay and contribute to the community. 
And uh, George Washington has a large alumni base and lots of students come to George Washington because of the city itself. And then they graduate and they pour into our, our companies and our institutions and our charitable organizations. And so, so you're the lifeblood of what the future of the city is all about. And I'd like to thank you for being here. Uh, we're gonna put you to work today too. Um, after we talk about the film, I'd like you all to go to Snag Films, and you can snag that film and then embed it into your Facebook page or your blog and retweet it and distribute it so that you can be a part of next generation distribution for the film. Um, and that's really what Snag Films was created to do. Uh, I believe that there's a lot of good work film that isn't seeing the light of day. And so over the last three years, we've been able to create a company headquartered here in Washington, run by Rick Allen, our founding CEO, um, where we now have aggregated more than 3,000 fantastic documentary films and independent films. And now these films are not only available for free on the web, but we're windowing these films where we can take these films and bring them to iTunes, bring them to cable for pay-per-view. They're available to view on more than 100 devices from the iPad to Blackberries to Roku and Boxy and literally everywhere that Netflix is streaming films, snag films is now streaming films. And my, my goal with, with it is to do well by doing good. We want to be able to shine the light on very tough subjects. We want these films to be celebrated and distributed far and wide. We'd like to activate charitable giving. And most importantly, we'd like to activate a lot of conversation around the subject. And that's all under this umbrella that we talked about called filmanthropy. So at this time, uh, Released for Life, uh, Washington's best film is live up on Snag Films. It's being promoted off of our welcome screen. Uh, it's being promoted aside some of the best documentaries that have ever been made. And so uh, the filmmakers and, well, the filmmakers who were involved in this project just stand up just for one second. A round of applause. <laughs> there, were, there were eight student filmmakers who all collaborated around the film. And that is a next generation theme where you can have multiple people who are working on the craft and the creation and the production of the film. And now we're going to rely on you and my associates at Snag Films to get the word out. Um, I watched the movie this morning, and Released to Life is uh, 16 minutes or so, and it is a, it is a very authentic, real film. Um, we hear a lot about reality programming on, on television, and I think this kind of film, being shot in HD, being available to everyone, is what we will see more and more of as young people use the tools available to them on the web to create great work, work that we can be proud of. And Release to Life is a very meaningful film. And afterwards, there will be a panel discussion on what is our responsibility of taking people who have committed crimes and now have served their time. What do we owe them as citizens to reintegrate them back into our community. Um, that work and effort the city has embraced greatly and we'll hear lots of speakers who are involved either directly or tangentially in that cause. Um, I'm really proud that Release to Life has won the first uh, Washington's Best Film Award presentation. And what I'd like to do now is have the student who was um, nominated as the person that would uh, talk about the film, um, Yavar Mohimi. If you could join me, please. And 
Congratulations to you and all the filmmakers. And here's the first award. It might not be an Oscar and Emmy, but it's close. Thank you. Wow, okay. So we started out just trying to learn how to make a student film and uh, to get recognized and get an award for it. Um, and then to be able to show the movie to all the people that you'd ever want to see it, the mayor, all these people who are involved in this issue. Uh, it's sort of you know, a dream come true that you can learn the craft of documentary filmmaking and get recognized for the artistry of it and to hopefully have the movie uh, make some change in some sort of way in, in this city where this is obviously a big issue. And, um, you know, all the other filmmakers, we, it, was, it was a great experience and um, hope you enjoy the film and stay afterwards for the panel so we can get into the meat of the matter. Thanks again. <laughs> Um, but here, um, but no, these are these are um, very very wonderful panel that we have today, and I'd like I um, we have one or two or two roving mics, um, and what we'd like you to do is if you raise your hand and you have questions, I want to throw this open to specifically our students. Um, we have many students here, as, as I said earlier, from the um, introduction to criminal law to um, you know I think there's a course in alternatives to incarceration. Um, and some of those students are here today. So I want to make sure that we're able to actually get some of our students engaged in what I think are some incredibly intransigent problems that are occurring at the schools. Um, this would help with the talks at Cypher Valley. Um, um, you know, so that we can actually sort of have a dialogue about are there solutions to this problem? And I guess what I, uh, of course, as moderator, I um, reserve the right to ask the Question. I'd like to throw the um, the, um, the question first um, to one of the subjects in the film. You know, Mr. Weaver, what are you doing these days, and what are the you know kind of like when you saw this film? Do you feel like it captures the quandary that you found yourself in, that you know others found yourself in? And can you advise some of the people on an esteemed panel today about how they might think about these issues? Yeah, you want me to come up there? Okay, maybe. Uh, no, you can sit down. You actually have a mic on. They can okay. hear you just fine. Uh, currently, I'm working. Uh, it's still a struggle. I guess Release to Life is definitely uh, a good title because it's actually 
what it is. Being incarcerated, I was incarcerated for 22 years. I went in when I was 17. I came home when I was 39. So it's definitely like two different lives to live in there all those times and then come back out here and I'm still shedding the layers of incarceration. Uh, I guess the main thing is to, like the films here, give us a chance. When we come out here just to release us out here and when I go apply for a job, you tell me I can't get this job because I had a criminal record. It's not giving me a chance. It's still keeping me on the side. And a lot of people don't have, like I had family support and friends, so I was still able to hold on out here with these uh, rejections. But a lot of people don't have that. If you don't have no family, you don't have no support, and you reject it when you come out here, the sooner or later you're going to go back to cry. Yeah. Mr. Quander and, and Ms. Ware, if I could sort of sort of implore you to talk a little bit about some of the new efforts, if there are any, um, that are intended to, you know, figure out how to bring, you know, especially in, a, in very tough economic times, it's hard enough for people who haven't been incarcerated to, um, to find jobs, to find themselves employment, um, you know, just to deal with current financial and economic circumstances. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of the programs that, you know, we looked here, it's like, looks like the programs are drying up. Um, how, do, how do we, um, what's the next right step? Uh, I'll start and then I'll defer to, to Nancy. Um, it, it is, it's truly difficult. Um, it's not only uh, the issue of employment, it's the issue of, um, of housing. Um, where's an individual going to stay? How's an individual going to, to live? And so we have to try to be as creative as we possibly can. They, um, these are tough economic times for, for everyone. So we have to look to, to bridge and to build uh, partnerships. We have to look um, to charitable organizations. We have to look to churches. We have to look to community-based organizations. And we have to do a better job of the outreach. There was one common theme throughout the, the movie, um, and it was referred to as, as coming home. Um, folk are going to, to come home, and they're going to go back to their communities. And either they can go back without any resources, or they can go back with some resources that will help them to be successful. From a public safety standpoint, when an individual is working, that individual is not committing crimes. It's just that simple. If a person is working, then that person, for the most part, is not going to commit crimes. So it's in everyone's interest to try to figure out um, that transitional period. How do we make it easier? Um, but also, how do we provide the support? Because it's difficult uh, for individuals to make that transition. And there, there needs to be a lot of support along the way. If I could just break in for one ever brief moment, it turns out um, because um, Council Member uh, Mendelssohn was not able to join us, we have been blessed with uh, Council Member Orange, who has agreed to sit in his stead. So if I could get Mr. Um, Orange to come up and, and, um, and join our panel and have maybe some students query him as well. Um, he'll be on his way up. And then, um, Ms. Ware, if you could um, give us your perspective. I mean, we know what the problems are. Right. Let's well, give me some solutions. Well, um, as many of you kn may know, SOS is responsible for the supervision of men and women who both come out of prison as well as those who are on probation in the community. And so as a part of that charge, we find that it's really important, as, as you heard from um, Deputy Mayor Quander, that we partner with community-based organizations, but we also partner with the faith community. We have a very uh, elaborate uh, faith community partnership that helps us with mentoring men and women who are leaving prison. We actually conduct video conferences with some of our prisons, the closest one being Rivers, which is an institution in um, North Carolina that is run by the Bureau of Prisons so that we can work with folks who are on their way out prior to their release, connect them to mentors here in the District of Columbia who are part of faith institutions. So they'll have someone, as Eric said, that's part of a network. Some men and women come out and their networks are broken. They can't get back um, into uh, their families they, or they may not have families. The families are not necessarily ready to accept them back at, at initially. And so we have to provide them with other support networks that are constructive in the community to help them reintegrate. We also have uh, a component of SISOSA that works very closely with our uh, folks under supervision to help them with employment. 
Um, we have uh, worked very closely with Central Kitchen, I'm happy to say, and we're always impressed with the graduates that come out of that program. But we need a lot more opportunities um, throughout the district. So we've uh, put in place an, an aspect of our agency called VOTE, which stands for Vocational Educational Employment Opportunities, um, to help them to prepare for the work environment, to develop their resumes, to get their GEDs, to do all the things that are necessary to get them ready for employment. We're able to help quite a few of our men and women to get to that point, but the part that's always very challenging, as you heard from Eric and others on the, um, the, um, the documentary, it's very difficult to break through those barriers. So we always need advocates. We need advocates like you, young people who understand the issues, go, who can go out and help us to educate the business community, government agencies, anyone who is willing and able to hire our folks who are ready. They want to work, as you heard. They're ready, but people have to trust that they can do it and that they will work really hard to um, become productive parts of the community. Education is another area, and most important for us is treatment. We have to work with district agencies like Deputy Mayor Quanders and the mayor, as you heard, uh, who, who uh, spoke a little bit earlier. We have to work with our treatment providers um, to be sure that men and women who need treatment, because it is traumatic when you're coming out of prison after so many years, to reintegrate, you heard the young lady on the clip say, uh, I think it was Anne, that she was very uncomfortable traveling on the bus. Uh, people come back, there's computers, there's all kinds of technology, there's Twitter. I don't even know about Twitter. So you know how it is when they come back and they're trying to figure all of these things out, trying to reintegrate back into a community. So we're working very closely with the Department of Mental Health, with our Office of Ex-Offender Affairs, and, um, Mr. Thornton is here. He's been really wonderful in helping us to educate the public and to work with men and women who are coming out to be sure that we all, as a collective community, put resources in place for those who are trying to return. We are nowhere near where we'd like to be. As you heard, things are drying up. Our, all of our budgets are getting cut. Um, universities can help. They can hire folks. Everyone has contractors. Everyone works with folks who need work. Uh, and who provide services. So connecting those dots is really important for us. I could go on and on. That's, uh, <laughs> well, that's your job. Um, uh, Mr. Curtin, you're part of the solution. Um, how have your folks been faring sort of since the recent economic downturn? And do you, you know, where, I mean, are you able to get them placed? <clears throat> what's, what's happened to your program in the current sort of economic climate? Sure. Well, first, on Briefly. the... On one end, we're seeing more and more people coming to the program or wanting to get into the program. Uh, and, and we are having trouble or, or more trouble placing folks. But we're still up in the high 80s or close to 90% of uh, finding job placement upon graduation for the program. But the problem uh, that, that we're seeing and, and has we've, we've sort of talked about a little or it was talked about in the film is that as the jobs that many of the returning citizens are looking for entry-level positions, particularly with DC Central Kitchen, the hospitality business. Um, an application pile maybe a few years ago was like this. You know, now, now it's like this. And the easiest way for an employer to get the, the, the stack down to this is just to broadly eliminate anyone who has a conviction or criminal history. And, and that's what we're seeing. There's not a discussion about it. It's an easy thing to do. Uh, and, and, and people aren't considering the consequences. And this is something that I, I hope we talk about a little or that people take away is we, we talked about sociology. We talked about um, uh, some different departments of the school and different areas where we need to be involved here. But what we need to be talking about, Council Member Orange, is as economic development. You saw that statistic at the end, um, two thirds, and that, that might even be a little high of people that, that get out of prison, reoffend, and go back within three years? Are you kidding me? So we have a system that, that works a third of the time. Um, and I, now I know, Ted, is Ted gone? Ted, I know he'd be pretty happy if he had that percentage in at least one of his business uh, endeavors right now. <laughs> but, but for us, um, the economic cost to our community is staggering. It's $50,000. This is another area where the district leads the country in cost to, to incarcerate. 
about 50 grand to keep someone in prison for a year. And if two thirds of those people are going to go back, that's money that we're never, ever, ever going to see again. And it's setting up a, a generational uh, systematic um, metric for failure and for bankrupting our system. Um, council so Member Orange, what, what's the council, what can the council do in the next year to make this better? Okay. Well, first of all, the, the council has a, a piece of legislation before it that would address some of these concerns, especially in, in the application process. Uh, like you've indicated, piles that high, you eliminate them because someone has a, a criminal record. Well, if this law is passed, the, the, that stage will not come until the very end of the process. So you're allowing the person to actually go through the entire employment process, and then at the very end, then you can inquire into that person's uh, criminal history. But at that point, hopefully the, the person will be able to uh, at least put forth a compelling case as to why they should be given the second opportunity, especially since they made it through the entire process and their employer has concluded, hey, this is a, a likable candidate, and this person can go forward. Also, I, I think we have to uh, you know, uh, lead by example. Uh, when I served Ward 5 for, for eight years, many people didn't realize it, that my director of constituent services uh, was an ex-offender. And he turned out to be you know, one of our better, better employees. Uh, in, in my life, I'm also an attorney, and I had an opportunity to, um, to practice on the Criminal Justice Act. And there was one uh, person in particular that I kind of took a liking to, because he always would get in trouble, and he always called on me to get him out in some kind of way. He just had, he was lucky. So for five times, I got him off. And then finally, I said, Listen, I just need to get you a job, so you don't have to keep calling me. And this is another person. He just turned out to be a good guy, and, and, and we work with him. Then we also have programs uh, or no, other organizations, like there's an organization called Cease Fire, Don't Smoke the Brothers and Sisters, there's Peaceaholics, there's other uh, you know, organizations that actually have leaders that are ex-offenders that know uh, exactly what's taking place, and they are able to provide services as well. But uh, the bottom line is we need to uh, you know, really examine this piece of legislation, strengthen it, get it passed, and get it in the workplace so we can provide an opportunity for everyone to have a good quality of life. That sounds like the right first step. Okay, so questions. I'd like to, maybe some of our students, hopefully, who are studying this issue and kind of have a um, sort of a, a perspective on it from, from a younger perspective also. Um, where's my first question? Who has a question? Yes, ma'am. graduate certificate program in documentary filmmaking. So in the first four months, we were basically learning the fundamentals of documentary filmmaking, and the last two months was our student film. So we each pitched our ideas, and um, this was in some ways a combination of you know, two ideas. We really knew that prisoner reentry was a big issue in, in the DC area, and we knew there were programs like DC Central Kitchen out there that were doing amazing work. So um, really making the combination of those two ideas into one film. And then the, the subjects themselves, we actually did find through a lot of um, the organizations that were sort of mentioned earlier that, that do reentry work. Some of them were faith-based groups. Um, you know, Eric had worked with Peaceaholics, and we had found him through that. Um, so basically reaching out to people who are already working with this population and, and asking them for, for folks that might be interested in participating. Mr. Weaver, I guess I had a question for you about that. Is did you feel that, you know, that the I mean, have, has do you think that the film had changed you in any way? Being involved in the film, sort of, you know, being, you know, talking about these issues, um, kind of confronting them, seeing the film. Does it did it sort of alter kind of your perspective at all? Uh, yes, it um, <clears throat> excuse, me. it enlightened me a little bit more because I didn't realize until I come to panels like this and discussions that it wasn't that many people aware of our situation, aware right. of our struggle. But when I see these questions asked, I get it. I get it. There's a whole lot of people that just don't know. Right. And so hopefully through this, people get to know and something can be done about it. I mean, I think what's really interesting in the film is that I think, you know, the one gentleman makes the comment that I think is right, is that, that uh, on the outside, people just want the problem to go away. 
you know, they're not, they think, okay, well, let's just put that person away. But, the, you know, the, the, it's very poignant when uh, the gentleman says, but we're coming back. So what are we coming back to? And, and I think that we, as a society, don't generally tend to think of that way. We think, well, you're gone. When you come back, it's sort of, now it's kind of your problem. Other questions um, or comments about the film? Yes, sir. I have a, a technical question. Is it, in fact, a film or is it a video? And what does it take to produce something like this in terms of time? How much time did you invest in this? And were there other added expenses? Did you involve SAG actors? Or was it a low-budget uh, production? <laughs> <laughs> they have as much time as I give them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so our director gave us two months, basically, to put together a, a short documentary, which, you know, this one was 16 minutes in the end. Um, there was eight of us working, some full-time, some part-time on it in production, post-production stages. Um, we didn't hire any actors, it was documentary films, so, um, and then we basically had access to all of the resources here, which were mentioned earlier in the documentary center. So in that sense, we didn't have to worry about studio costs or camera costs, uh, you know, the sound equipment, things like that. So, yeah, we were fortunate to have all the facilities at our hand. And um, my esteemed colleague and um, interviewer par excellence, Frank says no. I'd like to, perhaps he could give a sort of a shout out here. Well, question. I'd, uh, shout out is to the to the filmmakers. Great job. Uh, a lot of lot. Of, the answer to your question is a lot of time goes into something like this. But I have a substance question to the panel, and Mr. Weaver, I, I wonder if you could perhaps launch on it. I think one of the most salient points in the film was the point that was made about I can't get by on minimum wage. It's not just getting a job, it's what kind of job and what that job pays. What are you doing now? Are you making enough money to live? And how do you get past, the, past that hurdle if you even get them in pe uh, people, in front of people to offer jobs as to the quality of the job and the living wage that that job is going to provide? Uh, I actually was just talking to Greg about that uh, when I came in here. He asked what I was doing. I was telling him I was working but I'm working three jobs uh, just to try to make enough money to be able to live. I told them that. Uh, so that's the thing. I think when we do find jobs, they usually are low-level jobs with really no room for advancement. Are those jobs more than minimum wage that you're uh, working at? Yes, they're more than minimum wage, but I mean, it costs more than minimum wage to survive out here now. So it's not enough to survive, but it's more than minimum wage. And uh, like I told them, I'm working from 8 to 5, then I got another job from 5.30 to 8.30, then I'm working from five to nine on the weekend. So I'm working all these jobs just to try to survive. And I'm still living with my mother, so my bills are not as high as they will be once I move on by myself. Mr. Quandra and Ms. Ware, there's sort of a, there's well, kind of a system act, uh, sort of a, a, an economic problem there. Very much so in DC, and, and I'm sure the council member can speak to this as well. Um, you know, the economy of DC is, is, is very challenging. Um, many students who even graduate are, are competing with folks who are coming out who are trying to find jobs, so it's difficult. We've uh, really um, been very proactive in trying to engage the uh, business community, the construction community, um, our partners who do um, hospitality and, and, and service community to uh, get them to consider uh, bringing our folks in, providing them with training, and um, if they can't provide them with training, we work with the Department of Employment Services to provide the training so that they can be eligible and ready for these kinds of uh, opportunities that will give them upward mobility. As Mr. Weaver said, you know, it's very difficult when you're first stepping out to even have the opportunity, and even those who are coming out of prison who've had experiences such as carpentry, I mean, many people come out with all kinds of experiences, even with diplomas and are, are really struggling. So we try to, uh, to forge a pathway for them as best we can. We try to be advocates with the community of, um, of employers to help to soften the blow. We have participated in the Workforce Investment uh, Commission, and one of our staff is actually here, who's a representative, uh, Cedric Hendricks, who's worked very hard with them to try to engage the business community, the employers of District of Columbia, to uh, be open to hiring folks as they are the, as they are prepared to go into the workforce. We're also really um, committed to um, being sure that 
we provide them with every opportunity for training because the training component is so important. And the first thing that you'll hear is you don't have folks who are well trained. And uh, so we do everything that we can to work with the Department of Employment Services to be sure that they're trained in the areas that we've identified as the areas most likely to employ folks that we work with. And you saw in the, um, the clip from Central Kitchen where the facilitator was saying, well, everybody's not going to employ you. So you have to know as a part of your plan where you can get the jobs first. And so we've been working to take a closer look at those job opportunities in the district that are available. And then lastly, and then I'll turn it over to the other panelists, we think it's important to um, support, uh, I think it's called the first choice, uh, which is very important in the district because it requires folks who are coming into DC to hire um, people who live here people who are, are struggling and trying to find jobs. If you have a construction company and you're doing all these construction jobs that you're hiring from all over the United States, then folks who live in the district don't have an opportunity to compete for those jobs. So it's really important for students out there to become familiar with um, some of the um, challenges that this population is working on and, and facing, to, to become familiar with the uh, legislative issues that are either there to support them or there t as barriers. And uh, we've been working with um, um, the uh, Attorney General and uh, many of the people in the President's Cabinet to begin to open up the doors even in government. Because in government, we don't hire like we should. Federal government should be a major employer. And I do want to put in a plug that we also every year do um, Reentry Reflections Month where we, op we offer opportunities for people to come together to our citywide reentry forum, which is on February 9th. We have a, um, a particular uh, forum for women called Lifetime Makeover, which is coming up on the 11th. And then we have a citywide reentry assembly coming up on February 16th, all designed to engage this population and to engage the public in helping it. And I'll stop there. The, um, Quickly, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. The mayor initiated a, a program um, called One City, One Hire. And with that program, he went out to um, businesses and asked them to commit. And over 400 businesses did so. Within a relatively short period of time of about four months, um, we have hired or matched 2,000 district employees, district residents, with the jobs that have been offered by these 400 businesses. That, I think, is, is the, the right step to take. And many of the people hired are residents of wards seven, eight, and five. And it's where the unemployment rate is the highest in the city. And a number of the people hired are um, returning citizens. Um, the mayor made mention of a forum that took place this past weekend that was led by Charles Thornton of the Office of Returning Citizens. There are over 400 men and women um, who spent a good portion of their Saturday um, discussing issues and celebrating um, a lot of the success that um, they have um, developed. Uh, we often hear of, of the problems, but very seldom do we hear about all the good work that returning citizens have done. Um, many of them have made that transition. And as the council member um, indicated, it's a good thing when you don't know that the person that's providing the service for you is an ex-offender, because it really shouldn't matter, because they can do the job. And so the more examples that we can show, the better the trust level is going to be but the onus is always going to be on that ex-offender to demonstrate the trustworthiness and the fact that he or she is prepared to take the next step and to succeed. I got one more question. I'm going to give it to the young lady right here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I have two questions. Uh, one question. Oh. <laughs> you have. One question then. Uh, Mr. Weaver in the movie talked about the fact, or it was discussed, that you got an education when you were in prison. That's pretty unusual and very commendable. And you also, it was also mentioned that that program ended subsequently. We know that people who receive an education in prison are much less likely to return to prison and much more likely to uh, do the right thing. To what extent is the DC government working to make sure that rehabilitation in prison in general and education in particular is on the agenda because it's not just about reentry when people come out. It needs to start within prison. 
Maybe and Council Member Orange could start with that question. Sure. Um, um, what are you all doing? Yeah, well, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of a, of a person in particular. His name is Sidney Davis, who went to prison and did about 20 years. But during that time, when he graduated, he actually graduated with, with a degree from uh, the University of the District of Columbia. And now he's a, a bus operator for, for, for WMATA. So there are programs still out there where one can work through, uh, you know, work and, and go to college while they're incarcerated as, as well. But also just want to quickly indicate that, you know, over the next decade, the District of Columbia is going to cre create about 50,000 jobs. And, uh, and right now, the living wage has to be paid if DC dollars are involved in a project. I think now is, is time for us to have a discussion about providing another requirement that you have to uh, at least take a certain amount of returning citizens if DC taxpayer dollars are involved. Because as a policy for the city, uh, when people return home, it's better for us to help them you know, get, back on, get back on track and get educated and also have a job as well. And so we need to have a policy uh, incentive in place as well. This morning we just announced that uh, we have a surplus of $240 million. Our uh, fund balance has gone from $890 million. It's back up to $1.1 billion. So we're going to be able to uh, start doing more things. You see cranes all over the city. Uh, you know, jobs are being plentiful. So we need to make sure we just have a policy in place that can also address the issue of, of returning citizens. And I think the mayor is doing a great job with the One City, uh, one city and Hiring Program. He's, he's now been able to hire 2,000. But if we put a, a policy in place as well and provide some incentives, we can probably hire more. Let me, let me just um, respond as well. And uh, thank you for the question because it helps to illuminate an issue. Um, the district government doesn't um, have any prisons at all. Um, so the question is, what is the federal government who houses 6,000 District of Columbia um, offenders doing? And could they do more? And these are tough political questions. Because as I tell the mayor and, and as governors throughout this country know that they never get elected because of prison issues. But let something go wrong and they'll get fired very quickly. And so it's a question of where do we place our resources? People are coming home. And so we know that education works. We know that job development and skills development work. We know that substance abuse treatment works. The question is, why aren't we doing more? And how can we change the focus? And so what's important is for students and the citizens to demand that we do that. Mr. Weaver had one comment. Uh, yes, you said something about education and far as in the institution. And the guy that you was talking about, uh, Mr. Orange, Sidney Davis, I don't know him. And he got his degree, what, 30 years ago there. So that's how long ago they kind of stopped. I got mine like 15 years ago in prison. So the, the education part of prison stopped a long time ago. When they stopped, just, I guess, locking us up, throwing away the key. And um, so it's no really, the far as you can go is education in prison is your GED. You get your GED after that, you're sitting around all the time just with idle time, nothing else to do. They had little small programs, and I showed them um, during the course of the documentation that it was certain classes that I took like five or six times because it wasn't nothing else for me to do. I took computer literacy like five times. Every institution I went to, that's all they had was GED and computer literacy. So I had to just keep taking those classes over and over again. So, I mean. And I think the key, um, if I might, just for a second, um, to support what Mr. Weaver is saying is that, and what uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Quandra said, we uh, no longer run the prison system for the District of Columbia. So we, as a federal agency as well, SOSA, negotiate with the Bureau of Prisons to uh, try to put better pre-release planning in place and other opportunities. The one prison that uh, serves most of the DC offenders, code offenders, is Rivers. And um, it doesn't have all of our population because our population is all over the country. So we've been working really hard with the Bureau of Prisons to try to um, encourage them to uh, put certain programs in place, at least at Rivers, so that more of our, our uh, returning citizens will have some of those opportunities. But again, you're negotiating with another federal agency responsible for our folks who are all over the country, and they have national focus rather than just the district is a focus. So. I'm going to give the challenges. last word to our student filmmaker. Um, Yavar, what's, what's next? Um, well, as you can tell, this is a pretty big topic to fill in 16 minutes. I mean, we really just sort of scratched the surface of everything that's dealing with. Um, so 
you know, myself and one of, one of the other filmmakers have been sort of looking into how we could make this into, you know, a feature length, because especially since that time, a lot has changed politically. You're having people who, the sort of tough on crime, throw away the key type politicians who are actually in favor of prisoner reentry programs right now, basically because of budgetary issues. They realize that that path of, um, you know, incarceration isn't sustainable. So we're at a we're at a time where this is one of the few issues where there actually is bipartisan support in in the country to to focus on reducing recidivism and providing reentry programs. So we think there's a movie there that hasn't been made yet, and so we're looking for funders at this point. So if anyone wants to fund that Which film, come see us at the end. So it's not over <laughs> yet. So on behalf of the George Washington University and certainly the Institute for Documentary Filmmaking and the Documentary Center at the School of Media and Public Affairs, we can't thank Snag Films and the DC Office of Motion Picture Development enough for this wonderful award and the opportunity to raise this issue before you. Thank you for the, so much for the afternoon.